We are learning the halachot of Rosh Hashanah, Siman Taf Kuf Pei Dalet, 584 in the tour, where he speaks about Tfilat Shaharit and the laws related to it. Shaharit mashkimin e beta knesset u msadrin abrachot, ve korin azmirot kederech shomrim be Shabbat. The Tfilat Shaharit in the morning is just like Shabbat, ve yesh mekomot shemosifim mizmurim me anyano shel yom, kmo milefanech amishpati yetze. In some places they add more psalms, more mizmurim that are related to the to Rosh Hashanah. Today it's already in the Sidur. Back then, not everybody did that. We have some Sidurim that were print, that uh, were not continued, were not printed, and there are many, many different versions, but today each community follows its Sidur. ומחזיר שליח הציבור התפילה בכוונה ובנחת, מילה במילה, and the שליח ציבור, they, they say the Amidah, the Hazan uh, repeats the Amidah, the, uh, the importance of mentioning that, why would you have to say that the Hazan repeats the Amidah, the, uh, the Bait Hadash, one of the commentators says, that um, it is mentioned that on... Uh, other, other, uh, in another place in Halakha, that usually the Hazan covers for those who don't know how to pray. But on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, he covers even for those who know how to pray. Because we usually know how to pray because the Tefillah is more complicated. That, well, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the two uh, emphasized the, the Halakha of repeating the Amidah because there were some places where there was no Hazara on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Because the tefillah was long and complicated, they would do only one tefillah. Even, we'll see later, even when it comes to Musaf, and in Musaf we have tekiot, the, the doubling of the tekiot before, before Musaf, during the silent prayer, and during the Hazara, was not always like that. You only had 30 uh, voices that were sounded during the Musaf. So technically... If, let's say in our podcast, we want to do all the tkiot before the tefillah, and then do kol ram without hazara for Musaf of Rosh Hashanah, it is allowed. And I would even argue that it's, it's better because people don't uh, get bored or start talking in tefillah, becomes prolonged and, uh, and, and difficult to, to tolerate for some people. However, he says, <coughs> He says, שליח ציבור, ולא יסיחו שיחה בטלה. That's more, more than a halakha. I would call it wishful thinking. That, a good luck. That, it says, everybody has to pay attention to what the שליח ציבור is saying, and not to uh, have conversation in between, which unfortunately doesn't happen. It's a problem. And it doesn't help when people uh, raise their voice and yell at those who speak, because they eventually drive them away from the synagogue, so this is a serious problem. It's better, this is a general comment, it's better to find ways to uh, make the tefillah a little shorter for people, either something that you could follow the Ashkenazi Minhag of saying just the beginning and the end of a certain paragraph, instead of reading it all uh, out loud. And also, what he says here, Yesh Mekomot, Shonoagim Lomar, Piyutim Me'anyano Shalyom, in some places people add Piyutim, uh, poems into the tefillah. In some ways, if this takes half an hour, and uh, and uh, it is it just prolongs the tefillah. Now we have to talk about this a little bit. The the piyutim and yano shelyom, the uh, they were introductory uh, poems. They were an introduction to the main pieces of tefillah. So. <clears throat> To make to make to give this importance in the, on Rosh Hashanah, so all all year we say Yotzer Or Vore Choshech, right? Berkat Yotzer the Brachot before Kriyat Shema, and uh, on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur there were special introductions, a poem before you start at Yotzer uh, Or Vore uh, So that was if you if you say it in this place in Tefillah, most people don't get to the synagogue at this time, so it's fine. And there's another minhag where this was moved before Baruch Shamar because they were concerned about the piyut becoming a uh, disruption between 
השתבח, מנחל חי העולמים אמן, אין יוצר, they thought maybe you should, some people argue that you should not stop there, so they move it before ברוך שאמר. If you say it before ברוך שאמר, I think it's ideal, because the people who are at this point in the synagogue are really those who are dedicated and willing to sit the three or four hours and they don't, they don't talk and they concentrate. But when you move it to after the tefillah, first of all, it's lost its position in the tefillah. Instead of being an introduction, it's just uh, you know, sitting together and singing without the uh, gradual progress in the tefillah. And it becomes a burden for some. So this has to be considered. Um, to in each synagogue, you know, people should follow what they do. Um, this we know that we don't, we don't say Halel on Rosh Hashanah, which is interesting because on every Rosh Chodesh, we say Halel. Mm-hmm. Rosh Hashanah is also the first day of Tishrei. It's the only Rosh Chodesh in which we don't say Halel. Not only that, Rosh Hashanah is, is, is Yom Tov. Just like Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. Why don't we say Halel on Rosh Hashanah? Which, by the way, this year we'll have an interesting situation where we'll have five consecutive days in which we read the Torah on, on each day without saying Halel. Usually it doesn't happen. You only have it when you have two days of Rosh Chodesh, but then you have Halel or Hanukkah, Halel. To have five consecutive days with Kriyat Torah without Halel in any of them mm-hmm. is very rare. It happens this year because Rosh Hashanah falls on Thursday and Friday. Mm-hmm. So we read the Torah and we don't say Halel. Then comes Shabbat. Then Sunday. On Sunday we usually don't read the the Torah, but this Sunday will be the fest of Gedalia, which is postponed from Shabbat to Sunday, and then comes <laughs> Monday. So it turns out we have five consecutive days, Thursday, Friday, Rosh Hashanah, Shabbat, Tzom Gedalia, and Monday. Why don't we say Alel? Says the two. Amar Rabbi Avhu, Ameru Malchia Shared Ifnei Kadosh Baruch Hu, Ribbono Shel Olam, Mipnemai and Omrim Yisrael Shira Lefanecha, Lo Berosh Hashanah Velo Beyom Kippurim. The, the angels ask God, why, why don't the people say Halel? And the answer, he answers, Efshar ani yoshev al kisedin v'sifrei chayim v'sifrei metim lefanai niftachim v'yisrael yom rushira. Is it possible that I am uh, sitting on the throne of judgment and I open the book of the dead and the book of the living and the, the, the people will be singing? Of course it's impossible. Now, this is interesting because we read in the previous siman that the Torah says that our practice is not like that of the non-Jews, of the pagans, because they dress uh, when it's a day of judgment or the thing of the, this kind of, uh, um, of holiday, they would dress in black, they would pre- uh, act like mourners, and, but we dress in white and we have a festive meal and all that because we, um, we rest assured on that Hashem will accept our repentance. So if that is so, why don't we say Halel as well? And also, think of that, that many of the Piyotim that were added later on to the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, some of them are more uh, serene, more uh, serious, but some of them are joyous. So if you don't say Halel, why don't you say that? So that is not written in the two. I'm just adding uh, this insight. It's interesting that it comes from Rabbi Avhu. Rabbi Avhu lived in the 4th, uh, 5th century in Caesarea in Israel or as in Israel we call it Kesaria. And uh, Kesaria had a special position as a cosmopolitan city. It was, it was a Greek city. It was called uh, later on named after the, the Roman emperor, the Caesar. <coughs> and Jews from all over the, the Greek and Roman world lived there. And Rabbi Avu also, also was very close with the, uh, with the fathers of the church, uh, who who lived there? I mean, they knew him and respected him. So he's a sort of cosmopolitan figure. And what happened in Kesaria actually influenced a lot of the prayers and the practices of Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Avu had the, the authority to establish some of the minhagim. And what he had in his community were people who came from different different places because they said they were of the uh, of the elite of the community. So some people came from Rome, some people from, from Greece, some people from Israel, Babylonia, and they all come into one synagogue. And what happens when you come 
you take people from different community, different places, and you put them in one synagogue, you will have <coughs> clashes. We have to do it this way, we have to do it that way. I mean, we think, we think it's, uh, it's our invention. It's not. It has been around for 2,000 years. So Rabbi Avu established some of the practices of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. But then people argued, why are you doing that? So before Rabbi Avu, before his time, probably there were practices. In some places people did say Halel. In other places they did not say Halel. Rabbi Avu d- decided that in, the community, in his community they will not say Halel. And he explained it with a Midrash, with a dialogue between the angels and God. Why are, why are they not saying Halel? And God says, how is it possible for them to say Halel? And it's probably also part of his uh, um, agenda, of, of his attempt to make the Rosh Hashanah more venerated, more, more respected as Yom Adin. For the same, uh, we'll see later on, that also the concept of Tki'ot Mi'umad, Tki'ot Mi'ushav, that we have two sets of Tki'ot. Some of them are done while the people are sitting some of the Nadam, while people are standing, also come from the same school of Rabbi Avu, for the same reason. Some people, when, when they all uh, congregated in the, his synagogue, some people said, wait, we, we do it while sitting. Other people said, we'll do it while standing. His solution was, okay, we'll do one set sitting, and one set standing. Um, and then the tour concludes here. Once each one is read the Torah, by one we read the we know, we read the parasha of the Akeda, and uh, which is split over the two days. And the Aftara is the story of Hana, who prayed for her son, which on on one hand it parallels Sarah asking for her son and praying to Hashem, but also. The importance of reading this story of Hana is that Hana is the first one who taught us that one can pray directly to God. This is also not written in the two, I'm just expanding on that. That the importance of Hana's prayer is up until the time of Hana, people used to turn to the leader, to the Kohen or to the prophet to, or to Moshe Rabbeinu to pray for them. Hana was the first one who went in, into the Hechal, all the way to the Ark, and prayed for herself. And because it was an innovation, Eli, Eli the, the high priest, who was sitting by the door, didn't know what was going on. And he tells her, Enough with drinking, he thought she's drunk. So if he was used to see many people coming in and praying at the ark, you wouldn't think that she was drunk. But because she was the first one to do it, she went in and she prayed uh, by herself. He didn't understand what was going on. So the, the, uh, the message that the story of Hannah conveys is very important, that we don't need intermediaries. We don't need someone to pray for us. A lot of people do that, you know, go to the tzaddik, go to the rabbi, go to the Kabbalist, uh, or maybe come to the synagogue and let the Hazan pray for you. And the story says, no, you have, you have to pray. You have the direct line. Just use it. Um, oh, now, Bet Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo adds to this commentary. He says, Noagim b'ksat mekomot, Noagim b'ksat mekomot, Lomar berosh hashana harat fila, Avinu malkenu, Hatanu lefanecha. Some places have the, in some places there's a practice to say, Avinu malkenu. Right? We're smiling because everybody says that, right? So here's the example. The tool in the uh, 13, 1400s doesn't mention that. The Bet Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, in the 1500s says it's a minhag, it's a practice. Today, everybody does that. The Kataba Kolbo, and they bring the, 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 uh, the source for that. Venir Ali, the Sha'ar Bakashot, Shomrim. באבינו מלכנו אומרים בראש השנה, אבל חתנו לפניך, וכן כיוצא בו דבר שיש בו הודעת חטא, אין אומרים. מהטעם שאין אומרים וידוי בראש השנה. רבי יוסף קאו אומר, I, I feel that we should not say, in the אבינו מלכנו, חתנו לפניך. Because חתנו לפניך, we have sinned, it's a confession, it's called a וידוי, and you don't do וידוי on ראש השנה. You don't confess for your sins on ראש השנה. And some other pieces should have been omitted, but... The Remar, Rabbi Moshe Israelis, says very uh, tacitly, We don't follow uh, his ruling. 
So that's interesting also for us because we know Sefaradim. We think we always follow the Shohan Aruch. We always follow Rabbi Yosef Kao. Here he says, this is how you say it, and we don't do that. Um, so the Ran writes in the Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is to Some say that Rabbi uh, Nisim or Chelona says that you don't say Avinu Malkeno on Shabbat. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Tzemach, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Tzemach Duran, who was, he was expelled from Spain and lived in Algeria, Katab Bichuva, Aminah Gulomar, Avinu Malkenu, Ben Be Rosh Hashanah, Ben Be Shabbat Ben Taim, Ben Be Ma Kippurim Shachrit Omecha. The Minhag is that you say Avinu Malkenu every Shabbat, whether Rosh Hashanah, uh, whether on, on uh, the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur or Kippur itself. Um, and or whether Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat. So what about the opinion of Rabbeinu Nisim? You have two great rabbis. Rabbeinu Nisim lived in the 13th century in Spain. Rabbeinu Darashbaz, a little later, moved from Spain to, to Algeria. Who's right? He says, Afar Pisharam lo katavken, to'aya b'minag mekomo. He says, Rabbeinu Nisim didn't write it. He didn't know the minag, his own minag. To'aya, he made a mistake. He says, Kmo shamanu mitamidav peel peh. He says, I heard from some of the Tamidim that he did say that. And all these things depend on, on Minhag. And he who changes the Minhag, is not, it's not approved uh, by the rabbis. They don't like it. Basically, they were trying to maintain the Minhag of each uh, uh, community. Uh, finally, uh, Rabbi Bet Yosef brings this. Uh, another an additional halakha that has to do with Kirat uh, Torah on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah. What do you do if there's a Brit Milam on Rosh Hashanah? In many places, the Minhag is if there's a Brit Milam on Shabbat, you do it after the Tfilah. When do you do it on Rosh Hashanah? Uh, ideally, you would have thought you should do it after the Tfilah. But they decided not to do that. The reason. Uh, I'll explain why, what the reason they give here. They do it in the middle of the tefillah. But I think one of the other reasons was that after, after Shofar, everybody would already want to go home, and it was difficult to make, uh, retain people in the synagogue. So he caught the Rosh, or Ben Asher, Berosh Hashanah, Malin, Ben Kriyat HaTorah, Litkiyat HaShofar. When do you do Brit Milah? If there is a Brit on Rosh Hashanah, after the reading of the Torah, before blowing the Shofar. Why is that? כתב בתורה תרדשן שאתה מישום דקה חסדר ברית אברהם ועקדת יצחק. Because if it corresponds to the, to the reading, first we read about Abraham doing the ברית מילה for his son, and then the עקדת, the binding of יצחק, and the shofar reminds us of the horns of the ram of יצחק. והרוקח כתב בסימן רשות זין שאתה עם לפי שהשכינה אצל התורה, קוראים תורה ביל עזר of worms, ברמייזה, the author of רוקח is the reason is that Shechina is next to the Torah, meaning that uh, it's more of an opportune <coughs> moment, auspicious moment to do the Brit Milah. Uh, and, and so the, Bet Yosef, the Shohan Aruch rules is a, is a clear thing, even though it's a mention in, in the Tur, Malin ben Kiyad Torah lit Kiyad Shofar. And here, the, one of the commentators, the Magen David, Rabbi uh, <coughs> David Cohen, adds this, Shamati Shagahon Arav so he heard, this is that Rabbi Favish of Krakow, he was, he was a muhel, and when he had the Milan Rosh Hashanah, he had a very interesting minhag that I would not recommend anyone to follow today, and that is, he would not wipe his mouth after the Brit Milah, the idea of that Mila and Shofar are connected because of the Brit of, of, of Yitzhak and then the horns of the ram of Akedah, uh, Rabbi Favish took it to the next level and if he had a Brit Mila, he wouldn't wipe after sucking the blood from the Brit Mila, he wouldn't wipe his mouth and would blow the Shofar with, with, the, uh, with his soiled mouth to, to mix together the two mitzvot of the Brit Milah and the Shofar. Not recommended. Yeah. <laughs> it's Minhag. And I explain like, also like, sort of like the, back, the, the, the behind the scenes of the thought. The Midrash says that uh, we use the Pasuk, 
Vomalach bedamai chayi, vomalach bedamai. One, one pasuk. The I I passed and I saw that you were rolling in blood and I told you, from your blood you shall live. This is a this is a, uh, a prophecy in Yehezkel that we use this verse on in the Haggadah, and that is based on the Midrash that says that God redeemed Am Israel. We were redeemed of Egypt for the merit of two types of blood. Not only B plus or B minus, like. Two different uh, uh, contexts of blood: the blood of the mila that they did the all perform bring mila in order to eat the pesa, and the blood of the korban pesa. So the idea of mixing of two different types of blood: one is a personal sacrifice, one is the animal. So he took it to the next of it and said, "Let's mix the, the blood of the of the bring mila with the potential blood of the akeda symbolized by the shofar." Why I'm saying it's not it's it's. Uh, not recommended. Today, uh, most Mohalim try not to even suck the blood, what is called metzitza, directly by mouth because of the danger of herpes that uh, could be transmitted to the baby. There were cases <laughs> of babies that died because of that, even though the ultra Orthodox community denies that. In New York, there is an attempt, uh, there is a still a struggle going on between the uh, the, the state of New York, that the state wants the mohel to inform the parents of the potential danger. Meaning they're not going to, to force it on the parents to do, it's called metzitzah bapeh, to suck the blood from the milah by a mouth or by a tube. They're not going to enforce it because they don't want to get involved in uh, religious practices. But they want the mohel to inform the parents of the potential danger, which seems, you know, Totally legitimate, even within, because there's no uh, intervention halakha. But the uh, the Haredi community in Borough Park is going to war against that. For them, even telling the parents that there might be a risk is like uh, destroying the Torah. Meanwhile, there were cases of death, so not recommended to suck the the blood by mouth, and definitely not to blow the shofar with that. But who knows what is going on? As much as you clean it, what will be transferred to another person? But that's just interesting to see how sometimes the, you know, the religious mind works to create another uh, level of ritual. We'll stop here.